celebration God's faithfulness to us all right please have a seat we're going to continue now with the word of God hey what happened it's supposed to be now oh then we got I want to introduce Michael Katz who has prepared a midrash for us and he's on more on top of it than I am that's okay. Thanks for the introduction, Rabbi Jeff. Okay. Shalom and welcome here. If you're late, you want to say hi and online. You know, King Solomon reminds us in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 that God has set eternity into the hearts of mankind. And not only has God created us to live eternally when we die and pass on from this life, but he has also set the consciousness of eternity into our hearts. There is in the heart of every human being a consciousness that there is more to life than just this current existence on life, right? For some, this contemplation of eternity is more prevalent than in others. Some are very much in tune with it, whereas others have buried it deep in the recesses of the heart, covered with layers and layers of philosophy, atheism, and intellectual pride. But there is something that can break through these layers and lay bare the relevance and urgency of eternity in the soul of men and women. And that something is trial and tribulation, hardships and suffering. 
there's a peeling away of the layers of pride and self-sufficiency of the heart that opens up the heart to the reality of eternity when we are faced with trials and hardships. Isn't that so? The hard heart is softened, pride is broken, and when all human hope and avenues of salvation are exhausted, the heart turns to contemplate the eternal that is hidden within it by our Creator. Eternity can be compared to a solid and everlasting foundation. It lasts forever, doesn't it? Every time God creates a child and it is conceived, He places into its heart eternity. But we know as life progresses, we as people, since the time of Adam and Eve, have tried to build our own foundations into our hearts. And so over time, the solid foundation of eternity is covered with the sands of our own deeds, thoughts, ideologies, mindsets. And we build our houses, our security, our reliance on these sands. And we know that any person that is not in a living relationship with God through Messiah Yeshua has a foundation of sand on which they are building. We can observe in life that trials and storms have this uncanny ability to strip away the sands of a weak foundation. It will strip away until only the bedrock remains. Have you ever seen those beautiful beachfront homes being devoured by the sea during a storm when the waves erode the beach until it, the waves hit the, the, the houses and they just collapse right into the sea. Or the raging rivers that carve these deep gullies and then slowly it edges closer to the homes and they just collapse right into the water and disappear in the torrent. <clears throat> Unless the foundation of a house is firmly affixed to a solid bedrock, the rains will destroy its foundation and cause the house to collapse. And when that house breaks down, we become more open to the eternal. When we realize that the strength of man and the weapons of our warfare are insufficient to save us. Thank you, Michael. When we can say with King Solomon that the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. And when we can agree with King David that a horse is a vain hope for salvation, even its great strength cannot save. That is when we start to examine more seriously, seriously the weight and relevance of eternity. Oftentimes, God has to bring us people to a place of desperation and brokenness before we are willing to open our hearts to Him. I think we've all experienced this, even in our own lives. And King David makes mention of it in the Psalms when the persecution and suffering causes him to turn towards God with an increased intensity. We are currently living in a time of tremendous trial and pressure. The events of the last two weeks have sent waves of grief and torment, torrents of pain and destruction into the hearts of our people in Israel, our neighbors, into our own hearts and into the hearts of the Jewish communities across the world. For many of our people, this extremely challenging time has stripped away our sense of safety and security. It has stripped away our ability to trust in our technology to save us. It has stripped away our sense of belonging and acceptance in this world. And many are left with a gaping wound at the bottom of which eternity looms. Many people are seeing that life is merely a breath and that it can be cut short in an instant as it was on Saturday, 7th October 2023 for over a thousand of our people who perished adjacent to the Gaza Strip. So allow me to share a crucial bit of news with us. We as believers, you and I, through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and reveals God's love and kindness to this world, we are the only ones who are called empowered and able to bring healing and hope to the wound of those whose foundations of sand has been washed away. Think about it. No amount of aid or money, though necessary and lifting and fitting, can bring back those who have been massacred. Even words of comfort, unless they are infused with the genuine and powerful love of God, can sound hollow or at the most provide a temporary relief of pain. And time does bring relief, but it brings a temporal belief, relief because time also ends one day. Any help that is not accompanied by the good news that brings true hope and change, even though it is right and necessary, will not be able to heal the wound of our people. It will provide a plaster for the wound, but that plaster will also fall off once the temporal 
is exchanged for the eternal. Let's allow the weight of this truth to sink in for a moment. You and I are the only hope for restoration, healing, and revival that our friends, our work associates, and neighbors have in this world and for the world to come. God almost always uses His Spirit in filled children on earth to bring the good news. And so I ask myself, and I ask you this morning, how then can they call on the one whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? So let us allow ourselves to be moved by this great wound that is now in the hearts of our people. Let's allow our feet to bring the good news of salvation with an even greater sense of urgency, sharing God's love, His healing and compassion with our friends and our neighbors and our work associates. Let's be sensitive and open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, looking on how we can share and spread godly love, hope and healing. Nachamu, nachamu ami. Comfort, comfort my people is the mission that God has called us to now. Mission first and people always. And the only comfort that lasts and that is truly impactful is the comfort which God can supply. Are you and I willing to be vessels that are willing to be poured out into the lives of our neighbors and our friends? Are we willing to be vessels of comfort? We have the I Found Shalom cards there in the back a wonderful tool to put some hope into someone's heart, into their hand. Everyone is looking for shalom right now. So be bold. Take those cards. Take opportunities to share the good news. And yes, not everyone will want to receive your input, as Romans says, but not all of them welcome the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? But for those who are willing, and they are more now than before October the 7th, 2023, Let's be willing to share the good news. Let's be alert to our neighbors, our friends. Let's probe their hearts willingly, skillfully, and with sensitivity to see whether they are open to receiving not only a temporary plaster, but the life-giving balm of Gilead, the healing waters of the Holy Spirit, and the salvation of our God. And I want to leave us with the wisdom from Proverbs 11, verse 30. For the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. Father, hallelujah. Lord, we give you glory. Thank you that you've given us who know you such a precious tool, such a precious eternal plaster, a salve, a healing balm that we can put into the hearts of our people. And I ask right now that you'll take away hindrances, fear of man, um, Lord, just thinking what people will think of us or whether they will respond good or not. Lord, take that away from us. We bind hindrances and I ask that you'll open up our hearts with love for our people to be able to share effectively and well for the sake of your kingdom and this for the sake of comforting our people in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Let's stand together and sing one last song. Praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is lifted high. Adonai is with us, our help in time of need. I say to the Lord, my shield and my defense, Elohim, I trust in you. I cried out to Adonai, and He answered me from His holy place. To me, Adonai, mom and mom. To me, Adonai, gets for us. To me, Adonai, mom and mom. To me, Adonai, fighting for us. To me, Adonai, mom and mom. Praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is lifted high. Adonai is with us, our help in time of need. I say to the Lord, my shield and my defense, Elohim, I trust in you. I Holy place, you mean I don't know what I'm up. You mean 
a great service already so far and we're talking about Revelation the book of Revelation and I'd like to begin today by taking a look at the name of the book Revelation it comes from the Greek word apocalypsis Let's say that together Apocalypsis, all right. It's all Greek to me, but I don't know. <clears throat> and that is a compound word made up of the word apo, which means off or away or to separate, and kalupto, which means to cover up or to hide. So when they're combined together, it means basically to take the cover off, to uncover. It's like pulling the curtains out of the way so that you can see out the window. It's an unveiling. All of a sudden, now you can see because something's been removed. The cover is off. Revelation. This word and its root are used extensively in the Brit Hadashah and mostly in reference to supernatural revelation of divine truth. Of course, the Bible, the whole Bible is a revelation. This is an unveiling from God. But it is truth unknown to man and incapable of being discovered by man. In other words, if God didn't reveal it to us, we would never be able to know it. That's revelation. It's beyond our knowing and the only reason we know it is because God has unveiled it. He has revealed it. The book of Revelation is such a revelation. Unknown and unknowable, yet revealed to us by a God of love. Amen. A God of love reveals himself and reveals things we need to know. And it is not only revelation, it is prophecy. Revelation is also prophecy. It speaks of things to come. And God gave us this book filled with revelation and prophecy for a reason. And I want us to look at that reason in Revelation 1, verse 1. 
A very simple reason, but he gives it right here. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. That's it. That's why he gave it. To show us things which must shortly or swiftly take place. He gave us this revelation and prophecy because he wants us to know it. That's why he gave it. We're to know it and understand it because knowing it and understanding it gives us a significant advantage. It's a tremendous advantage to know events in advance. Advanced knowledge in any endeavor is quite an advantage. Think of advanced knowledge in the field of investing. Who would like that kind of advanced? <laughs> or advanced knowledge that suddenly the real estate market is going to either tank or go up or some other new thing is going to happen. We would all revel in that kind of advanced knowledge. It's a tremendous advantage to know in advance things which will swiftly take place. Advanced knowledge as to how things ultimately consummate. That is the book of Revelation. How are things ultimately going to consummate? And having that knowledge will enable us to endure to the very end. Because we know how it ends. You see, that's why he wanted you to know it. To give you strength and fortitude to endure because the end is so good, it's worth fighting for. Even if it costs us our life. That's why there's this unveiling. To put strength in our soul to endure. And if we know, we won't be deceived, especially the deception of the latter days. Now, God wanted all generations to know these things, but this is especially for a generation that will see the return of the Messiah, the final generation. And look at what Rabbi Shaul says about the latter days. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Rabbi Shaul says, now the Spirit expressly says, or explicitly says, that in the last times, or the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Why? Did they intend to? No. They gave heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The world is going to be treacherous, but you know what? The spiritual world, the world of people who profess knowledge about the spiritual world is going to be very deceptive. Deceiving spirits who bring false doctrines. So if we know these things in advance, we can be prepared. That's why he gave it to us. And if we know... We'll know what to do and what not to do. For example, here's a little piece of advice. Don't take the mark of the beast. That's something not to do, okay? So we know in advance it's happening. When it happens, you'll know, don't do that. It's worth staying faithful and not doing that. So in short... This revelation and this prophecy is given that we, you and I, might be overcomers to the very end and receive a full reward. That is the reason that God unveiled this. Now, I want to ask our ushers to give this outline out, please. Could you do that quickly? Just go and send an down through the aisles 
And we also have the outline on the overhead. So I developed an outline. Everyone has their own outline for Revelation. You read 10 commentaries, you'll see 10 different ways to break the book up. This is the way that I did it. Uh, I didn't want to do this series for four or five years. So, uh, <laughs> but it's going to be a, a fairly lengthy series with these 17 um, units of scripture. So I'm giving it to you to know you can have it. You'll see how I'm approaching it today. We're in unit one. We're going to do verses one to eight. That's what we're doing today. And not every unit will be able to be covered in one day. Some of them are much longer. But uh, this is how I'm going to proceed it. It's a simple outline. But I wanted you to have it in advance so that you would know, so that you would be prepared, <laughs> and that you could read along even before the service that day. So let's take a moment and read the first section in Turn to Revelation chapter 1, and I do want to encourage you to bring your scriptures to the uh, service. Uh, I know some of us use the phone, okay, um, but there's small travel Bibles too that you can use, but we're going to read verses 1 to 8, Revelation 1 verses 1 to 8. The revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly or swiftly take place. And he sent and signified it or communicated it by his angel to his servant, Yochanan, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads... And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Yochanan to the seven kehilot, or congregations, which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Yeshua HaMashiach, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us or freed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and they also who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So that's the portion we're going to look at today. Um, and I want us to notice, you know, the first thing that struck me is this uh, progression of how this revelation uh, came to us. It came from God, the revelation which God gave to. God gave it to Yeshua, who gave it to his angel and sent his angel to John, or Yochanan, and then John communicated it in writing to the Kehilot, and then, of course, it comes down to us in that way. But I thought that's a very interesting, you know, progression. God the Father is the fountainhead of all revelation. God the Son is the agent through whom it is imparted. And as I was thinking about this, it, it seems to be written in a way that almost makes it seem like, well, maybe Yeshua didn't know what the revelation was until God gave it to him, okay? Um, I think even though it's written that way, I don't think it means that Yeshua, who is in his glorified state, would not know the revelation until God gave it to him. 
because we know that God is one. Three co-equal persons of one Godhead. One God, three co-equal persons. Yes, on earth, Yeshua limited himself to a degree, and he didn't know all things. Yet not after his resurrection and ascension into heaven, he put back on the fullness of his Godhead. Remember, in Philippians, it says he laid aside certain things and humbled himself, but now he's fully God. Although he was fully God then, though he was limited. Though they are co-equal, yet they occupy different roles. It's like marriage. You know, uh, in a marriage, husband and wife are almost equal. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Husband and wife are equal, right? Absolutely equals. Yet within the marriage, there are roles that are assigned. The husband is the head of the house. Isn't that correct, Janet? <laughs> See, I got a yes and amen there. How many wives can say yes and amen to that? All right. So even though we're equals, there are different roles that we play. So even within the Godhead, that is true. Okay? So I think that that's the sense uh, of this this progression. And Yeshua, Yeshua then receiving. He was, he, God initiated it and Yeshua forwarded it, so to speak. Yeshua then sent and communicated it through an angel. And this is not unusual in the scriptures. And it was well understood by the early Messianic Jews. For example, look in Galatians chapter 3 verse 19, what Rabbi Shaul teaches about the giving of the law of Moses. Galatians 3, 19. What, and he's talking about the purpose of the law, but what, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to, who the, to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through Angels, by the hand of a mediator. Angels were involved in the transmission or the communication of the law of Moses. Stephen said the same thing in Acts chapter 7. There are an immense number of angels. In fact, one of God's names is Adonai Sivaot, the Lord of what hosts? Angelic hosts. Multitudes. Now, last week I kind of quantified it 10,000 times 10,000. And I don't, it's really not meant to be quantified that there's an exact 100 million angels. It's more symbolic of an, an innumerable myriad of angels. Okay? This week, as we were praying for Israel, I really felt led, and as we pray this afternoon, I'm going to encourage us to pray this way. Now, um, I have heard people, and I don't think anyone here, so I'm not referring to anyone here, okay? I'm not stepping on anyone's toes. We do not have authority, in my view, for us to loose angels. I loose angels would be a prayer which I think is in error. We don't have, I don't see an ounce of authority in the Bible. For us, they're not our angels. They're God's angels. But we do have authority to beseech the Lord to send his angels. As it says in, in Psalm 91, verse 11, Psalm 91, verse 11, for he, meaning God, shall give his angels charge over you. God has authority to release angels over you. He will give his angels charge over our men on the verge of going into battle in Gaza. Amen. I believe it. 
to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Angels, in Hebrews it says they're ministering spirits to minister to those who shall inherit salvation. So they're sent by God to serve us. So Yeshua sent his angel, and the angel communicated it to Yochanan. And in, in verse 2, regarding Yochanan, the angel, um, he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, Yochanan. In verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah and to all things that he saw. So it was given to Yochanan, this revelation, this prophecy, this testimony was given to Yochanan that he might bear witness of it to others. He was not to be the sole beneficiary of it, but was to share it with others as Michael exhorted us. That we're in the midst of a war. People are suffering and in pain Now is the time that they may be more open to the good news of Yeshua. So let's do our part. Let's not hoard the gospel and the revelation to ourselves. Let's be like Yochanan who faithfully shared it with others. He called the revelation and the prophecy he received the word of God who bore witness to the word of God. And that included the testimony of Yeshua. The testimony, that's a unique language. There's a fascinating interaction about the testimony of Yeshua in Revelation chapter 19 that involves an angel. Revelation 19, perhaps this very angel that was commissioned, and I think it is this angel, John stumbled a little bit. Yes, the apostle John stumbled and made a mistake and was immediately corrected by this angel because of the glory that this angel bore. Look in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet, that's the angel, to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. That's something we don't do. There's a good example of being prepared not to do. If you see a glorious angel, don't worship the angel. Okay? See, he was corrected. John, you know, fell down at the feet of this angel and to worship him. And he said, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brothers who have the testimony of Yeshua. Worship God. For the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. I have thought about that portion of scripture for years. And I can't say that I I have a total understanding, but I do have a thought about it. And what it means to me is that as we bear witness of Yeshua, a prophetic anointing is released. That in the, in the testifying, as we testify about who he is, what he did, how, what he did for us, and how he, the whole gospel, that it releases an anointing, a prophetic anointing. The testimony of Yeshua, which is the gospel, is more powerful than we know. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And we need to have confidence in the gospel. See, I believe this book was written that we might have confidence in the last days. I was meditating this week in my devotions about boldness. And I began to think, what is at the foundation of boldness? In other words, the way I do it, I shared with you how I kind of meditate. 
I think of the ideal person who is bold. It's kind of like courts, you know, they, they have this thing, uh, what would the prudent landlord do in cases? What, and then I say, what is the attitude of someone who's bold? How do they think? And what came to me is that they're confident. They're confident in something. Boldness in the gospel means that we have confidence, that we know that it's true, and no one can shake that confidence. And that confidence gives rise to boldness. And that is what God wants. Overcomers have this confidence in the gospel that cannot be shaken. And it will release a boldness. I'm not talking about a brashness. You know, quiet confidence and boldness is pretty potent. You don't have to be, you know, get up and yell and raise your voice. You could be really confident, but gentle, but firm. And that carries something. God wants us to be confident in the gospel. Be rooted, not in ourselves. Our confidence is not how smart I am, how much knowledge I have, how much education I have. That stuff can pretty easily be stripped away once things get going. But when you have confidence in the gospel and you know it's true, you can't be shaken. You cannot be shaken. And you won't be shaken. Amen? And so a component of being an overcomer is the willingness to bear witness to those around us. Turning back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Of course, in those days, most people had to hear it. They weren't, many of them didn't read, so it was a much more, you know, audio uh, way of receiving. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. The bottom line of this verse, blessed is he who keeps what is written. No matter which way it comes, whether you hear it, whether you watch it, whether you read it, the important thing is what you do with it. You know, I finished reading a book, interesting book. I'm not going to recommend it. It's a secular book. But I've, every now and then i got to just read something else. It was a book about survivors, people that survived serious car crashes, airplanes, and, you know, and, and they, all, all kinds of scenarios pilots that get lost and have to survive for days and weeks. And, and you know, one of them, a famous uh, survival specialist, basically said the key to... Wait, I actually, do I have that here? Did I bring it? I didn't bring it. All right. All right, forget it. Let's go on. No. The key to survival, listen to this, is applied knowledge. It's not book knowledge that you have. That's only potential knowledge. It's knowledge that you apply that helps you survive. That, that was him. Secular book. Okay, it's not the Bible. <laughs> but I think it's interesting because it's similar. Having the word of God but not doing it, isn't that equal to not having the Bible in, essentially? Those who don't have the Bible can't do it. Those who do have the Bible and don't do it, same fruit, nothing. It's applied knowledge that bears fruit. And you know, this it, where it says, blessed is he who reads, there are seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Seven times throughout this book, it's kind of like Yeshua. Yeshua's are all together in Matthew 5, these are spread out, blessed. This is the first one. But mostly, if not all of them, are associated with those who do something. 
Okay, for example, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. We'll skip to the last one. Revelation 22 this is almost at the end of the book. Verse 13. Oops, not verse 13, verse 7. Yeshua says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who, what? Keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed are the doers. That's how we overcome. I prefer the word overcome than survive. You know, how do we overcome? By being doers of the word. This is the teaching here. There is no question about it. An overcomer is a doer of the word, not just a hearer. And if you're here today and you weren't here last week, my pastoral thesis of the book of Revelation, the main pastoral message is for us to be overcomers, okay? To me, that's how I'm reading it. That's how I'm teaching it. That's why I'm emphasizing it. Here, because we're going to need this. We're going to need to be overcomers. And we're looking at various components of what it means to be an overcomer. And that means being a doer of the word. Now, I had another download. I'm, I don't know. Some of you may be praying for my devotions, but I'm really having really good devotions. So I really had a download about this idea of a doer from another passage, and I want to share a little bit about that. To do, or to be a doer of the word, okay, it means to act, to do something. I know that's not revelational <laughs> so far. But then I began to probe it a little more. And what do I need to do to act? It means that I'm actually overcoming inertia and taking initiative. So to be a doer, we need to take initiative, initiate. It requires an active will, an active will. God wants you. Now listen, if you're going to live by faith in the last days, you know, we come from all kinds of backgrounds here, all kinds of congregational teachings and cultures and so forth. But at City of David, we are a front lines congregation. We've always said we are a battleship congregation. We're not a cruise ship. We're a battleship. And we need to have fighting faith to fight the good fight of faith. And that requires an active will that takes initiative to overcome inertia and actually do it. Overcomers have an active will. But that also means the enemy wants to seduce us into oh, passivity. And he wants to suppress your will, the suppression of the will. He will seduce you into slothfulness. He will suppress your emotions so that you become discouraged, apathetic, or indifferent. I pray for my will. I sense sometimes a suppression trying to come on me to keep me, you know, like suppressed, my emotions or something else. And I take authority over that spirit of oppression, an oppressing spirit that tries to suppress our will so that we're inactive and passive and pose no threat at all to him. He will try to deceive you by inducing you to deflect the word so that you don't relate it to yourself 
You don't personalize it for yourself, and it passes over you onto someone else. Oh, that's a good word for so-and-so. It's like Rabbi, Rabbi Solomon <laughs> in uh, Atlanta when he used to talk about tithing. He used to teach this at the rabbi's conference. He says, some people get saved from here, but it skips over their wallet and goes down here. See, unless we personalize, we relate the word of God to ourselves and personalize it, it does us no good. And so I want to talk for a minute about two things in the spiritual realm and two things in the natural realm. I'm staying on this because I told you I had a download in it, and I just figured I'm, I'm going to bring it on here. I'm going to share this about the active will and the passive will. And taking initiative. Because I've discovered, by the way, leadership requires initiative. And I realized, well, wait a minute, you know, if anything's going to happen, I've got I've to take initiative. I've got to act. And I realized I need an active will for that. I can't just be carried and float. And we can't do that spiritually. Two things. One is from Yaakov chapter 4. Verse 7. Now, I learned years ago about deliverance. Deliverance ministry. And I want to encourage you to become skillful at self-deliverance. A lot of any oppression, anything suppressing you, can be handled through your own self-deliverance. And here it is, James 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. Come to the Lord. Give yourself unto obedience to him. Make yourself open to him. Submit to God on the one hand. Yes, I want to do your will. I want to be a doer of the word. On the other hand, resist the devil. And he will flee. Resist him. But it's like an arm wrestling match. Who wants to arm wrestle me here? (laughs) Arm wrestling. It doesn't, you can't just say, get out of here, you. No, they're not compliant. It requires an active, forceful will to submit to God on the one hand, but to resist the devil. Get off of my emotions, Satan. Away from me. Away from my will. I will have an active will. I'm believing you, Lord. Now, I can't tell you how many times I have received deliverance, not that I was possessed. There's a difference between possession and an oppression that comes on us, like a depression. In our emotions, especially now with what's going on. If we don't stir up the fruit of the Spirit, we can be weighted down in depression through this war. And that is not God's will. You're not going to be any good for yourself, for your family, or for praying for the nation of Israel. We pray from a position of faith. Amen? So guard yourself. Guard your emotions. Guard your will. Lord, give me a listening heart. Give me an inquiring mind. Give me an active will. That's what I pray for. So, secondly, that's the spiritual side of it. The natural realm is that we take personal responsibility for the word of God. Take responsibility. Relate it to yourself. Don't be like Rabbi Solomon said. Don't get saved from here and let it skip over your wallet in in reference to tithes or coming to services or worshiping or praying. Whatever, Whatever it is, take responsibility. Personal responsibility. 
and then overcome inertia, take initiative, transform thought into action. All right, let's move on. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. God wants us to be doers of the word of God. Now, these messages I'm giving are quite different than the way I'm, I've been preaching. You know, this is a book study, so it's going to be a little different kind of a teaching style. Revelation 1, verse 4. John to the seven kehilot which are in Asia. Do we have that map? Can you put that map up here? I want you to see this map. This is a map of, basically, there it is. All right, so basically, this is Turkey, modern Turkey. It's Asia here. Yochanan was here on this island. And all the seven congregations are right there and the order in which they are is the order that it appears in the scriptures. The exact order. The first one was to Ephesus. You see where Ephesus is? It started with Ephesus, then Smyrna, see? And then Pergamos. And then Thyatira. Sardis. What's next? Philadelphia. That's where they um, initiated the cream cheese in those days. <laughs> but in those days, they called it Asian cream cheese. No. <laughs> and then the last one is Laodicea. So that's, I, I thought that was so interesting that Rab, um, Rabbi Yochanan wrote these letters in that exact order. And of course, there were more than seven congregations in that area, but these were representative of really all the congregations in Asia, and frankly, representative of all congregations in all time. So they're really representational congregations, but the letters were written to them, okay? There's a, a context. All right, so that's fine. Verse 4 uh, he says to the seven congregations, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is, is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. He's the, obviously the eternal one, unchangeable, seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, I wanted to take a minute with this because it's, it's a mystery. Seven spirits. We know that there is only one Holy Spirit. Amen? There is only one Holy Spirit. There are not seven Holy Spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit, but he's presented as having a sevenfold fullness, meaning completion and perfection, a sevenfold wisdom and and all basically omniscience. And of course, we said last week that the book of Revelation is soaked in the Tanakh. So just quickly, I want to look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 2. This is a messianic prophecy. There's a sevenfold thing here of the Spirit. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That's seven right there. The Spirit of yud heh vuv -Hey, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might. It's a full manifestation, a sevenfold fullness depicted in Revelation as the seven spirits. And frankly, it's also in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Another messianic prophecy speaking to a man named Joshua, who was the high priest in those days. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, 
you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. That's a messianic title. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. You see that? Seven eyes. And drop down to chapter 4, verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven, meaning the seven eyes on that stone, these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord. Seven eyes of the Lord right here in the Tanakh. And then finally, I want to look in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Revelation 5, verse 6. A picture of Yeshua in, his, in heaven. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns, what is the horn a sign of? Power. Power. Sevenfold power, meaning omnipotence. Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. There it is. Yeshua omnipotent. Yeshua omniscient, all-knowing. And these are the seven spirits of God. Hallelujah. Turning back to Revelation 1. Revelation 1, verse 5. And from Yeshua the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins, in his own blood, and made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they which pierced him. This is an amazing portrayal of the gospel right here. Yeshua giving, given three titles. He's the faithful witness. He remained faithful to the end. He's the firstborn from the dead. Not that he was the first to be resurrected. There were other resurrections. Elisha raised that boy from the dead. Others were. Yeshua himself raised people from the dead. But Yeshua is the firstborn from the dead unto eternal life. His resurrection was different in that it was unto eternity. The others who were raised from the dead died again, but Yeshua never died again, and being the firstborn, he represents all who would follow him in faith, so that if he rose from the dead, we too rise from the dead, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if he rose from the dead, we too shall rise from the dead, that's that confidence that we can have. He's the firstborn from the dead and ruler over all. And he gives us three things that enables us even more to become overcomers. It says here that he loves us. You know, love brings out the very best, doesn't it? When you know that God loves you, it'll create an atmosphere to bring out the best in you. Amen? Love brings out the best. His love brings out the best in us. He washed us or freed us from our sins. He freed us from the very thing that could have defeated us. If we're going to be defeated, it's because of sin. But he's freed us from sin. It's finished. We're free from sin. And he's made us kings and priests to his God. We have 
authority. And it says, Behold, Yeshua is coming with the clouds. So Yeshua died. He washed us in, our, in his blood. He rose from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's returning with great power. That's the gospel. And we need to have confidence in the gospel. Amen? I believe in the Do you believe in the gospel? Are you confident it's true? If you're confident, it will bring boldness and cause you to overcome in these last days. He's coming with the clouds. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And these things were written to give us confidence. We have the advantage of prophecy. He loves us and freed us from our sins. He appointed us as kings to co-reign with him. He's coming back. Our confidence is not in ourselves, but in Yeshua, the faithful witness, the firstborn, the ruler over the kings, the one who will return on the clouds of heaven, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Yes, we are confident in him, and because he overcame the world, so can we. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for giving us confidence, Lord. We have confidence in the gospel. We have confidence because you've given us advanced notice. Thank you for confidence that gives rise to boldness and tenacity. Thank you for this, Lord God. Release your unction and your anointing upon us. We take authority over fear and trepidation and lose confidence and boldness in Yeshua's name. Amen. Why don't we stand and let's worship the Lord. Wait upon me. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong, you'll strengthen your heart. Be steadfast, he will establish you. So wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong. Strengthen your heart. Be steadfast, he will establish you. So wait upon the Lord. And I have believed. I'll see your goodness here. I'll see your goodness here. In the land yes, of we're confident of that. I have believed. I see your goodness, Lord. I see your goodness here in the land of the living. And wait upon the Lord. Be strong, your strength and your heart. Be steadfast, he will establish you. So wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong, your strength and your heart. Be steadfast, he will establish you. So wait upon the Lord. I have believed. I'll see your goodness here. I'll see your goodness here. In the land of the living. And I have believed. I'll see your goodness. Lord, I see your goodness here in the land of the living. Kaveh Adonai, Kaveh Adonai, 
חזק וירס ליבך, חזק וירס ליבך, וכפר אדוני, ופעם דה לורד, ופעם דה לורד, be strong, your strength and your heart. He said that he will establish you, so wait upon the Lord. Surely, surely I trust in you. We believe you, Lord. The kindness of Adonai. Thank you for your love. Your kindness, Adonai. In the land of the living, surely I trust in you. The kindness of Adonai. Your kindness, Adonai. Be strong. He said that he will establish you. So wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong. Be strength in your heart. He said that he will establish you. So wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Be strong. Be strength in your heart. anointing, a breaker anointing here. Hallelujah. Especially for deliverance from suppression of emotions. You've just been down. You can't get excited about anything. You seem to be apathetic about things. It's the suppression of the evil one, my friends. He doesn't want you to have joy. When you have joy, you're a threat to his kingdom. Submit, therefore, unto God. Resist it. Get off of my emotions. God gave me emotions. Lord, I pray right now, and I join my heart and my prayers for anyone who is under a spirit of oppression in their emotions or their will is not at liberty. They can't seem to initiate or break loose into any kind of liberty, Lord. We pray for liberty today. We speak liberty that Messiah came to bring us liberty in Yeshua's name. And we take authority and resist the oppression of the evil one. We resist it. That's how I pray when I'm praying for personal deliverance. I'm not there saying, no. Oh, it's everything I got. Everything you got, resist it. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And even if you have to do it a few days in a row, it will go, my friends. It will go. And you will have a degree of liberty and joy and deliverance. Lord, I loose a spirit of deliverance and I loose a deliverance ministry here today. Self-deliverance. Where we can recognize it, we identify it, we put boundaries around it, we speak to it and command that it go and keep commanding it until it does go. Even if it takes several days. Lord, we thank you, oh God. We want to break through here. In Yeshua's name. And we have some prayer lines here. So we're going to have those who are...